Happy New Year. Are you ready? Come on, somebody. Still got a couple days to finish out the year. Hey, uh, on Tuesday, we're having an incredible uh, New Year's Eve service. I encourage you to come out. We're going to have a night of worship. It's one of my favorite services of the year because we just take the time and pray over you and your family, pray over every individual in the place, and just uh, take a time of just... The Bible calls it the laying on of hands. We just lay hands and just ask for God's blessing on you, your family, your business, your career, your future. And we just have a great time with it. So I want to invite you back out to that. Amen. Hey, today, I want to welcome everybody, by the way, watching in our venue and online. But today, I want to start a brand new series called The New You. And I love this time of year. You know, you have favorite times of the year. For me, it's not so much, I love Christmas, but the time right after Christmas and then this period of time through the month of January is one of my favorite times of year because you're, you're saying goodbye to one year and you're embracing a new year because I think God wants us to live in cycles and seasons. When you study scripture, the Bible's always talking about knowing the times, redeeming the time, being aware of the time, now is the time, and there's a lot about time in scripture, and, 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 and there's this beautiful thing that allows us to have times of renewal, and that's one of the things I love about this time of year. It's a great time to think about renewal. I, I, I don't know about you, but like in the spring, sometimes we have like spring cleaning, right? Well, this time of year is like mental and emotional spring cleaning uh, for me. It's the time of year to sit there and say, okay, what do I need to gather up and get rid of? And, and what do I want to hang on to? And and because you know when you do that spring cleaning, it feels good, right? How many know all, you're, you're going all through spring? I, I got to get to that. I got to get to that. I got to get to that. This is the time of year to get to that mental, emotional, spiritual preparation uh, and, and get ready because it's a time of renewal. It's a time to say uh, one chapter is closing. The next chapter is opening. Uh, one season is closing. A new season is opening. Uh, you know, bear with me for a second. I'm a big, I'm a big football fan. And I love football. I'm a big NFL football guy. I love college football as well. But uh, for the NFL, NFL, the National Football League, this is the last weekend of the regular season. So this weekend, there are 20 teams. There are 32 teams in the league. For 20 of them, the season is over. It's over. You know, and for some of them, they're glad. And they're, they're like glad. It's like we're glad the season is over. Any, any Cincinnati Bengal fans here? A anybody? No, exactly. They have no fans. People who do come to their games put a bag over their head, right? It's like I'm embarrassed to be here. It's like that's my team. I'm for you, but I'm embarrassed to be here. You know, they're really glad. They've won one game this year. One game. They play 16 games. If they lose today, they will be 1 and 15. How many know they are glad the season is over? Here's another team, the Miami Dolphins. You hear this team, Miami Dolphins. When they started the season, their, their, their hopes were so low because they said, you know, we don't have a very good quarterback. We don't have a very good team. And so they really weren't expecting to win any. A lot of people thought, well, you could go the whole season and not win a game. This year they've already won four games. That doesn't sound like a lot, but they're like excited. Like, we won four games this year. Our expectations were so low, we got to four. We're so excited for this season to be over, so we, we're ready to launch into next year and do new great things next season. Come on, somebody. You know, and for everybody, a season is different. You know, like, like, like the Cleveland Brown. Any Cleveland Brown fans? Right? Don't, don't be shy. It's like, so some of you want to raise your hands. Some of you want to raise your hands. It's like, it's like Cleveland for the last whatever decade have been like horrible. And then last year, last year, they had some success. I mean, I mean, they got some players, they got some names, they got the bragging, they got the, they got the talking about how great this year was. The prognosticators were saying, hey, this could be a Super Bowl team this year. It was incredibly disappointing. I mean, they don't even have a winning season. And so they're like, okay, let's. I'm glad this season is over. And, and, and here's my thought. Here's my thought. 2019 is almost over. And whether it was a good year, an average year, or even if you make it all the way to the Super Bowl, a great year, it's time to say goodbye to one season so that you can get ready to the next season. Because in professional sports, there's no carryover. 
You don't carry over your losses, and you don't carry over your wins. Come the next season of 2020, it's 0 0 to start the year. So, no matter how great my year was, how average my year was, or how uh, poor my year was, I get a brand new season, and I'm entering a new season. Regardless of how great, average, or poor 2019 was, it's important for you and I to learn how to embrace the next season of our life because if I don't embrace the next season and I carry last season with, I feel like I'm in a hole. I, 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 I feel like I'm not prepared. And so it's a new season to get ready for. Now, here's, here's the critical part we have to understand. As I, as I go into a new season, what is it that I need to let go of and what is it that I need to hang on to? And, and I'm going to say some things, and, and you're going to know that it's like, yeah, that's so obvious, but I trust me, most people, most people, while this is clear, uh, uh, clearly obvious, most people confuse this all the time. How, how many know one of the things we want to hang on to is our hope? And what we want to let go of is our disappointment. I meet people all the time who get that backwards all the time. They let go of their hope and hang on to their disappointment. How many know, how many know now's the time to sit there and say, you know what? Uh, it's time for me to let go of my failures and hang on to my lessons learned. But many people, they hang on to their failures and never learn a lesson. How I many know it's the time of year to sit there and say, you know, I, I need to let go of my bitterness and hang on to the Holy Spirit so that I have the fruit of the Spirit operating in my life. But how many times do we hang on to our bitterness and let go of the Holy Spirit's leadership in our life and say, I won't forgive, I won't let it go, I won't move on. And so we, ho we hang on to the wrong things and let go of the good things. And I'm trying to encourage you as we go into this new series, a new season, it's time to become the new you. And the Bible talks about taking off the old man, which grows corrupt, and put on the new man, which is made in Christ Jesus. And so I love the beautiful analogy that God's constantly giving us. It's like, take off the old and put on the new. Take off the old and put on the new. And, and, and Jesus illustrates this in a beautiful parable in Luke chapter 5. And, 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 this, and when Jesus taught in parables, let me just break this down for a moment. When Jesus taught in parables he would take a natural example that the audience would understand to illustrate a kingdom principle to live by so in this example he's talking about sewing a piece of cloth on, an, on a, another piece of material or putting wine into a wineskin analogies that they would have understood in their day but what's more important he's talking about the principle of new and old and how new and old don't mix and how we have to become new to receive the new. And so here's what I want to do this morning. There's like three slides on the screen or you can follow along in your outline. I want us to read this together. Can we read it together? So I'm going to count to three. On three, let's read. One, two, three. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskin will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires the new, for he says, the old is better. This is so loaded with meaning and and, 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 and what Jesus is saying is that when it comes to new and old, we have a tendency to hang on to the old. We say the old is better, and we, we're less read open to embracing the new. You know, people say, people say I, I, I'm all for change. What they mean when they're all for change, they're all for somebody else changing. I, I, I'm, I'm a change agent. I'm around change all the time. I will tell you right now, most people, when they talk about change, they're talking about, I'm all for change. I just want somebody else to change. I, I don't want to change. The world would be better if everybody else changed. And, and, and because we have a tendency to want to hang on to the old. But what God is saying in this parable, he's teaching us, there's some new things he wants to do in our life. And if he wants to do something new in our life, do we match? Because if we don't match, in other words, God's saying, there's some things I want to do, but it don't match the old you. There, there's some things I want to do in your life. It doesn't match the old person of who you were. I need you to become the new you. Then he talks about that the new, if you try to put new cloth onto old material, when it shrinks, it will stretch it and tear it. How many know that when God tries to do something in your life, 
it will always stretch you. I'm going to say that again. Whenever, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Whenever, whenever God wants to do a new work in you, he will stretch you. But do you resist it or do you embrace it? Because some of us, if we're not careful, we've not been stretched in our faith. We've not been stretched in our Christianity. We've not been stretched in our walk with God for a while. Because here's what God is saying. I will not stretch you to the point that it tears you. So am I, am I, have I got a pliability to me? Am I, have I have some elasticity to me? Or am I re- rigid where God can't stretch me? Do, do, do you remember, do you remember the, when God stretched you? Do, do you remember the, the, the first time that you wrote out your tithe check? stretched you huh do do you remember the first time God says I want you to go and pray for that person and he's like but God I I don't know them and he's telling you I want you to go share your faith with them and God you're stretching me or he said I want you to forgive that person that hurt you it's God you're stretching me Or, or I want you to make a commitment to my house and my family but God you're stretching me do you remember those times they should be old times just went by some of you right there some of you are still trying to be at that place. You, you, you've been a Christian for a number of years, but God's still trying to stretch you in the same places it should have been stretched already. But I'm finding that God continues to stretch my giving. God continues to stretch my submission. He continues to stretch my love for people. He, he continues to stretch me. And here's what he's saying. He says, but I will not stretch you to where it tears you because then it just sabotages the work in, that I want to do in your life. And so here's what God is saying. You set the limit of how much new I can do in you. You set the limit of how much new I can do in you. And then he tells the next example. He goes, no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, when that, wine be- that new wine begins to ferment and expand, it will tear the wine skin. The wine will be spilled and ruined, and the wine skin will be ruined. And so what's the purpose? Let me say it like this. If God wanted to do something great in your life, could you handle it? I'll say it like, if God wanted to do something big and new and fresh in my life, could I handle it? Because God never wants his blessing to become a curse in your life. I'm going to say that again. God never intends for his blessing to become a curse in your life. How many know that marriage you prayed for? Many people act like it's become a curse. It's like God said, I gave you what you asked me for, and now you complain about it. Come on, somebody. I, God, I, I just want to be, I just want to be used by you. I just, I just want to be used by God. You ever pray a prayer like that? And it's like, God, they're taking advantage of me and they're, they're using me and they're, they're, they're hurting my feelings, God. And it's like, I answer your prayer and you complain. I don't answer your prayer and you complain. There's a theme. <laughs> Here's the thing. What if God wanted to do something great, big, new, fresh in your life that stretched you, would you match? Would you resist? Could you handle it? I'll say it like this. Would I match? God, if you want to do something new, after 30 plus years of ministry, after nearly 40 years of being a Christian, is there something new you want to do in my life? God, is there something that you're wanting to do but I'm resisting you God is there something you want to do and could I handle it God could I handle it could I could I grow to the level of what you want to do in me because you never mean for your goodness to sabotage me how many times have I seen God bless somebody with business then can't find their way back to church how many times have I seen God someone prosper someone's life and forget and forget their generosity how many times have I seen God give people what they've asked for or give them a blessing of God and then and then their immaturity sabotages what God gave them and my, my, I'm not trying to beat anybody up today. Here's the thought I'm trying to give you, because uh, today I'm just introducing this series to you. Uh, so just, just hang in. Be, bear with me for a few minutes. Um, think of it this way. What if, what if we matched? Let's say, hey, as a church, we're just going to match what God wants to do, both in my life individually, in our family, but also in our church family corporately. Let's just say, God, we want to match you. We want to match you. Here's my question for you. What could you accomplish in the next five years, if you match God, what could you accomplish in the next 
five years if you matched God. Normally, this time of year, we talk about setting one-year goals. And many people have New Year's resolutions. Anybody got New Year's resolutions? A couple of you. Good luck. God bless you. I'm going to try to help you out a minute here. First of all, most people don't write down goals. Statistically, most people do not write down goals. Successful people do, but most people do not write down goals. But of those who write down goals, most of them, they're not aligned. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But of New Year's resolutions, New Year's resolutions, by January 12th, not even two weeks into the new year, 92% have abandoned their resolutions. Not two weeks, 12 days. Oh, that stresses me out. Let's, let's go back to the old. I can't do the new. Let's go back to the old. So New Year's resolutions don't really work. Uh, uh, but what I want to talk about is how do we become a part of that 8% who figure it out? How do I become a part of that 8% that endure? How do I become a part of that 8% that stays consistent? How do I become a part of that 8% that really changes? And, 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 so, and so I'm not saying one year because here's what we do. We overestimate what we can do in one year and we underestimate what we could do in a longer period of time. Now, biblically, because this series is going to be about time. It's going to be about time. It's going to let you know up front. But, 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 most of, but the Bible tells us that we, we only get one day at a time. So any plans that we make, we have to make those plans in light of God's purposes. And, and, and so here's what I want you to understand, though. What could I accomplish by God's grace in the next five years if I matched? I wrote down a couple of things. Listen to some of these things. In five years, you could become fluent in another language. I mean, I might actually learn to speak English. In five years, if I keep working at it, I might actually learn to speak English. In five years, five years, you could get a degree. Think of that. You could get a degree. In, in five years, in five years, maybe not a degree, but you could get a whole new skill set for a vocation, and it could change your whole world, change, open up your whole life, and, and, and your career could take off and move in a whole other direction because you got a new skill set, new skill set. In five years, maybe you're the creative person. In five years, you could practice a musician, a, a, an instrument every day and become a talented musician in five years. Well, that's a thought right there. It's like somebody's like, wow, I'd like to hear myself play. Right? Why not? It's a dream in some of your heart. In five years, watch this. In five years, five years, you could read 60 books. It's a lot of books. It's a whole library. Some of you could have a library. And it would only be one book a month. Think of that, one book a month. I had a mentor taught me this years ago, and he says, if you read an hour a day on a particular subject in three years, you would become a local expert. If you read an hour a day for five years on a particular subject, you would become a national expert, a knowledge expert in that area. If you read for an hour a day on a particular subject, that same subject, that same field, for seven years, you would be an international expert on that subject. In five years, you could be a knowledge expert, a national knowledge expert on something that you're illiterate about today, and people would want to know what you think about something because you stored up that information. You stored up that knowledge. Think about that. In five years, in five years, you possibly could get out of debt. You, you, you really went after your debt in five years, maybe not completely out of debt, but you could, you could totally turn your whole debt situation around in five years. In and, 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 and five years, in five years, you, you could possibly buy a house or even buy it and sell it and make a profit from it. In five years, what could you accomplish? What could you do in five years? And so this series I'm so excited about because it's, it's talking about how do I take off the old and put on the new. So let me give you a couple of thoughts as we walk into this thing. As, as we go through this, don't be in a hurry to write down goals. Take your time. Listen carefully. This is not in your outline. This is all free. And I'm just going to let you know I'm not going to get through the outline today. Uh, I'll explain why just in a moment. But as we go through this series, as we go through January, take the time to align. 
Because here's why most people's goals don't work. I, I hope to make some money, or I hope to get out of debt, or I hope my marriage gets better, or I hope, and you write down a wish list. It's sort of like Santa Claus. Here's all the things I'm wishing for. So you write down these things that you would like to have happen in your life, and you call those goals, while your whole life is aligned to something different. The first key to really being successful is alignment of your life. And then when you align your life, you can set your goals. When you align your life, you can set your goals. Here's what the scripture says in Proverbs 19. It says, many are the plans of a person's heart. We can make all the plans in the world. We can have all the goals in the world. We can have all the dreams in the world. We can have all the hopes in the world. But it's the Lord's purposes that prevail. If I build my life on the purposes of God, I'm already on the foundation for success. Listen carefully. If I build my life on the purposes of God, I don't need to pray for power. There's power in the purpose. I'm going to tell you right now, it's just like going over and turning on the light switch. There's power in this building. The power is already wired into the building. The power already comes into the building. All I got to do is turn on the light switch. If I align my life up to the purposes of God, I don't have to try to get power. There's power in the purpose. I just tap into the power when I align to the purposes. So when you begin to align your life to the purposes of God, there's already a power for you to be successful. There's already a power. Do you know that when you're born of God, you're born to overcome? Did you, did you know that? Do you know that when you're born of God, you're created to be the head and not the tail, the top and not the bottom? Did you know that? Did you know that if God is for you, who can be against you? Did, do you know that you are more than a conqueror through him that loves you? Do you understand there's a power that's already available to you if you align to the purposes? So if I align to the purposes, I'm already tapping into a power that's going to help me and enable me to be successful. So I can go chase money or I can chase God who will prosper me. I, I can go chase my dreams or chase God and, and all good things will follow me as I pursue him so there's a power in alignment and 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 as we go through the month of January here's the other thing I want you to say not only take time to align take time take time to sit and soak don't, don't go hey I'm gonna write out all my goals it's it's the first of the year and write all these goals out don't be in a hurry take the time to sit and soak. come come to the weekend take notes write down what you're hearing said I, I cannot tell you the enthusiasm that's in my spirit right now. As I was praying and preparing for this lesson, I, I, I just felt like God says, David, you're going to be sowing seeds that grow up to become a harvest in people's life through the month of January. I'm going to say that again. You're going to be sowing seeds that are become, grow up in people's hearts and lives to become a harvest in their life. And the seeds, the seeds aren't necessarily what I'm saying. The seeds are what you're going to hear by the Holy Spirit. So take the month of January and start plowing your heart to create good soil. In other words, God, like a farmer, before he puts the seed in the ground, he prepares the field. So let the month of January be the preparation of your heart, be the preparation. God, I'm trying to become new. I'm trying to become a new cloth so I match a new material. I'm trying to become a new wineskin so that you can put new wine in me, God. So I'm going to prepare myself to be new so I can receive the new. Mm, come on, somebody. And, 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 and as you go through this, and here, here's why. See, a lot of times when you come to church, you think you're hearing a sermon. You actually don't hear the sermon until you hear the whole series. See, and I, I'm not talking about non-church people. I'm talking about Christian people right now. Most Christians are not regular church attenders. Most Christians, follow with me, attend, skip, skip, attend, skip, attend, attend, they're on a roll, then skip, 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 then it's Easter. They're like CEO Christians, Christian, Christmas and Easter only. No, I'm just kidding. But here's why that's important. I'm not even going to get out of my introduction today. I'm not even going to get through this outline today. And, and if you hear one lesson of a five-week series, you only got 20%. If you hear two lessons of a five-week series, you only get 40%. See, sometimes you need to prepare yourself to hear the whole thing. And, and, and let, me, let me break this down because, see, as you're taking time to get ready for the new you, because that's what I'm talking about, how to become the new you. As you're getting ready for the new you, one of the keys to success is just being consistent. How, how many would say, Pastor, I, if I could just be more consistent, I, I know I'd be, I'd be successful, right? <laughs> we all know that. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, duh. It's like my problem is a lack of consistency. Listen carefully. 
Consistency is more important than short-term intensity. That's why New Year's resolutions don't work. Everybody gets all oh, fired up. I'm going to go join the gym. I'm going to go get the equipment. I'm going to I'm fired up, fired up, fired up. Crash. Okay. You don't have that much rocket fuel. <laughs> you just need to get the little electric this car, just cruise on down the road. It's like some of you are trying to, you're trying to have a rocket engine and you just don't got the fuel for it and you burn out and you don't even make it two weeks. So ongoing consistency is far better, far more important than short-term intensity. Do you hear that? Because see, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. Just say, I'm, I'm going to start attending church and take that baby step. It's just like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm just going to try to set this, this, this goal to align myself to God's purpose. I, I was playing golf years ago, and I was with this teaching pro and with this other guy. And uh, the, the guy, he was playing like me. We're both not very good golfers. The, the other golf pro is a real good golfer. And so the guy that with me, he hits this really good golf shot, goes right down the fairway. He stands up. He's so proud of himself. He goes, you know, he goes, my problem is if I could just be consistent. And the teaching pro, I loved it. He goes, you are consistent. He goes, that was the accident. <laughs> he goes, your grip is wrong, your stand is wrong, your backswing is wrong, everything about the way you hold the club is wrong. It's amazing that ball went straight. <laughs> but then what we do, we take the one thing and say, ah, I could just be that. No, the reality is we're often inconsistent. So let me say it this way. What if, what if your journey, my journey to success Simply started by just attending God's church. Look what this verse says. It's just, just that beginning. Just, okay, okay, and bef before I just go take on the world and build this great business, and before I go do all this other thing, I'm just going to set this one goal of just try to be faithful to God's house. Why does that matter? Look what the Bible says in Psalms 92. It says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will what? There's a life source. When you get, when you get connected into this renewing system of just coming to church and and, and, and she said, well, somebody said, I'm just going through the motions. You know, sometimes going through the motions, if they're good, are still worth going through the motions. Going through the motions, if they're bad, you should change. But sometimes if you're going through the right motions, you should keep going through the right emotions. But those who are planted flourish. There's something about being planted that allows me to draw from. Some of you right now, because you're here today, you're here today, you're drawing from something. You're here today, maybe in worship, you drew from something. You're here today, and you might hear something. What if today, what if today you heard something that become a seed in your life that becomes a harvest in your tomorrow? You drew from the house of God. You're not going to get that from any football game that's on television today. You're not going to get that for anything that's in no deal that's at the mall this week. You're not going to get a seed of a harvest in what most people are spending their time on. But when you get planted in the house of God, just that one little alignment, if I get planted in the house of God, I can draw from it. And look at this next part. It says, they will still bear fruit in what? Somebody say, well, I don't want to bear fruit. I got my tube tied. I got snipped. I got cut. I don't want no fruit. I'm trying to not produce any more fruit. I'm done bearing fruit. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you have aged out. It's like my, my, my fruit don't produce fruit no more. And, and so you're aged out. But here's what God is saying. I don't care if you cut it, tied it, aged out. I still want to get you pregnant with hopes and dreams. I, you get in my presence, you get in my presence, and you're going to be one of those miracles. I got this miracle baby. See, some of you spent last year spiritually on the pill. And God was trying to get something in you. God was trying to plant a dream in you and plant a hope in you. It's time to get off the pill and let God give you a new thought, a new dream, a new hope, and to get pregnant with faith. But you've got to match. You've got to take off the old and Put on the new. And, and he says, you'll bear fruit. You'll bear fruit. 
I met a couple that first time here, just in the last service, he goes, he goes, Pastor, this is our first time here, and and, and I just want you to know, I, I, I'm 67, and, and we just started this brand new business, and I just felt like what you were saying was, was just what I needed to hear, because we're just stepping into this new dream. At 67, I said, dude, you're like my hero. I love people like you. I do. I do. Because retirement is, is, is a wrong concept. It's, it's like, really? That's your goal in life? To save money so you can retire? You should think about preparing for eternity instead of preparing for retirement. Yeah, you should prepare for retirement, but that's just another step on the journey to real success. I know, I know, I know. Come on, somebody. I'm fired up. I'm fired up. So, so I got like about 10 minutes left, and that's the introduction to this new series. That's why I told you we're not getting into this outline today. And that's why it's important that you, you know, just, just start with, just, I'm just going to come to the house of God. I, I, had a, I had a mentor taught me this years ago. He says, David, if you learn to make the big decisions, it'll help make your life more... Uh, 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 simple. It'll make your life a lot less complicated. And I, I go, what do you mean about big decisions? He goes, you know, like every week, every week, people have to decide if they're going to go to church. Every week. So they make the same decision 52 times a year. <laughs> Come on, somebody. They get up in the morning and say, are we going to go to church today? Do you want to go to church? I don't know. Do you want to go to church? Uh, is there any football games on, or do, do we need to get caught up on the laundry? You know, I, the house is kind of a mess. It's like, you know, we got some people coming over. I need to get shopping done for this week. It's like, no, let's not go to church today. Every week they go through. Make, do, you, do you know how much time that takes? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Three minutes? Times 52 to solve the same problem every week. Do you realize how advanced your problem-solving skills would go if you just say, I've solved that problem. What's the next problem? I solved that problem over 30-some years ago. Oh, you're not catching what I just said. There are certain, you know, it's like, hey, I'll tell you, give you another example because you're feeling picked on right now. It's like, somebody say, gosh, today was the day I chose to come to church. Uh, <laughs> I knew this was the week I should have skipped. <laughs> but when I chose to marry Kelly, I'd eliminated thinking about marrying somebody else. You know, before you get married, before you get married, what do you think? Are you the one? Every time you meet somebody, right? Come on, somebody. You're, you're, you're talking about, help me out, singles here. You're meeting somebody. It's like, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? Well, after I married her, I don't ask that question anymore. Some of you need to learn that lesson. <laughs> it's like, no, you've got the one. <laughs> Here's a thought for you today. Here's a thought. I've got to take off the old before I put on the new. I've got to take off the old before I put on the new. And so many times we're trying to put on the new without taking off the old. How many know you don't put on a new diaper before you take off the old diaper? Uh, trust me. When my kids were small, I, 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 I was dolphin tempted. It's like, I do not want to deal with the old diaper. Can we just kind of go around the old diaper and go right to the new diaper and just, just put the new diaper right over the old diaper? Come on. I know some of you thought that. It's like, it's like that old diaper is a mess, man. That old diaper is nasty. It's like, but how many know if you put the new diaper on the old diaper, it becomes immediately an old diaper? <laughs> it's no longer a new diaper. So sometimes you got to do the messy work of taking off the old. And so that's why I'm saying don't be so quick to write down your goals because, because this week and next week we're trying to talk about a little bit taking off the old. you got to take off the old before you put on the new you, 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 because I've got to take off my guilt before I put on the new life. I've got to take off my hurts before I put on my faith. I've got to take some things off before I put some things on. And, and here's what the Apostle Paul said about taking off and putting on. And Philippians chapter 3 says, I have not yet reached my goal 
I've not yet reached my goal. Anybody, I, 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 Paul, you're such an encouragement. I've not yet reached some of the goals I want to reach in life. I'm not perfect either. I haven't reached some of my goals because I'm not perfect. Any, anybody have some fumbles in 2019? Anybody make some mistakes in 2019? Anybody disappoint yourself? Did you disappoint yourself in 2019? Let yourself down in 2019? To disappoint some other people in 2019? Not perfect. Not perfect. Paul says, I'm not perfect. But Christ has taken hold of me. God has a plan for me. God has something he wants to do in my life. God has a hold on me. God's purposes have a hold on me. Does God have a hold on you? Can God reach into your heart and get a hold of you? We're singing that chorus just a moment ago, I surrender. It's something that resonates in those words. As I'm standing over there, I'm singing it. I'm saying, God, I surrender. God, what are the areas of my life that you still need me to surrender? What are the areas I'm holding on to? And if you try to pull them out of my hands, you're going to tear me. God, can I, can I surrender? Can I surrender? Can I surrender some things to you, God? Or am I holding on to those things? I lay hold of that what he's like. So, so I keep on, I, so I keep on running. I keep on running, struggling to take hold of the prize. I, I keep on running. I, I keep on running. I keep on struggling. Was 2019 a struggle? How many know the Cincinnati Bengals had one win? What if they show up at 2020? You know what? We're such a terrible team. We lousy. We suck. Nobody likes us. Nobody's our fan. We can't do anything right. So we're not even, we're just, we're not even going to play 2020. No. We're going to keep struggling forward. Got my friends over here, 49er fans. I've been 49er fans ever since I've known you. 49er fans when they weren't, no one wanted to be 49er fans. Last year, what, they won four games last year? Four games. Four games last year. If they win tonight, which I'm sorry they're not going to, but if they win tonight. <laughs> but already, already, well, they got 13 wins this year. 13 wins this year. Which will be one of the most incredible turnarounds in one season. They could have said, you know what, last year, we're, we're no good. We suck. Why even try? But Paul says, I struggle forward. I struggle forward. All right, so you sucked in 2018, 2019. Okay. Are you struggling forward? You let yourself down in 2018. Are you struggling forward? You relapsed in 2019. Are you struggling forward? You, you made some big promises and you set some New Year's resolutions, but you didn't make it past January 12th. Okay, so, so you, you, you struggled. You struggled. You, 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 you weren't perfect. Do you still have a goal? Do you still have a dream? Does Christ have a hold of you? Does Christ have a hold of you? Then I keep on running and I keep on struggling. I keep moving forward. Because what are the options? You are a child of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's calling you forward. He's calling you forward. He's not done with you. I don't care what you're dealing with in life. I don't care where your marriage is at. I don't care where your finances are at. I don't care how old you are. He's not done with you. He goes on to say in verse 13, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, he says, my friends, I'm going to invite the worship team out because my time is over, but he says, my friends, I don't feel I've already arrived. So I get it. I'm one of you. I, I've arrived. I'm not where I want to be. But here's what I do. I, I forget what's behind. I shake it off. I have a phrase when I used to play a lot of sports, if somebody made a mistake, if they if they struck out or they made an error or they fumbled the ball, you go up to them as a teammate and you say, come on, shake it off. Because you cannot take that mindset to your next at bat. You can't take that mindset to your next time we hand you the ball. You, you can't take that mindset the next time the ball is coming your direction. You need to shake it off because there's another opportunity coming. We're going to talk about time in this series. And the Bible has a lot to say about time. There's a chrono, chronos time, which is time in general, and there's a kairos time. It, you, ever, you ever been to an airport? Of course you have. When did you go? You had a kairos time. 
What's a Kairos time? The Kairos time is a specific time. It's when they opened up the door to board on your flight. General time is being there. Kairos time is going through the door. When they open the door, what do they say? Now boarding mothers and infants. Now boarding those who need assistance. Is that you? Then get on. Now boarding first class. If that's you, get on. Now boarding group one. Boarding group two. Boarding group three. Boarding group four. You should be in one of those. Because if you don't get on the plane at the Kairos time, you know what they do? They close the door. They close the door. I was in an airport one time, and I watched this couple come running up. The door was closed. The plane's still there. And they're saying to this couple, we're sorry the door is closed. And I'm watching as the plane sat there, I don't know, at least 40 minutes as they're begging to be getting on the plane. But here's what was happening. The ground crew was going onto the plane to find their bags, to take their bags off the plane because they missed their Kairos time. But we got to get home. We're sorry, we will not open the door at your Kairos time. We will delay this flight, but we will not open the door because your Kairos time has come and gone. Your Kairos time has come and gone. That's painful. But here's what I'm trying to teach you. Here's what Paul's saying. But we will put you on another flight. And there will be another Kairos time if you want to go through the door. See, the Bible says now is the time. Now is the time. Now is your Kairos moment to come through the door. Come on, somebody. My time is over.